All right, folks, this is Rebel Rasmus Mitch Bergeron. This is the Tornado Tony Pennekamp. And Psychic Tom Tashit, Crystal Ball, ready to go. And uh, we've got a lot of crazy news to talk about this week. Uh, Floyd Mayweather in and out of a fight. <laughs> Not a big surprise there. Uh, we also have uh, Sean Merriman is backed out of his bare knuckle boxing debut. The uh, wow. former, former football player that was hyped up as being part of this new enterprise in bare knuckle boxing uh, already left claims against as a promoter of bad business. Uh, he's not somebody to pull out something he's in uh, yeah, social media. So, uh, uh, but he's withdrawn. It's, uh, he's supposed to have a fight coming up this weekend, I believe. It's uh, Mike Bork. Yeah. November 9th. Yeah, in Castro, Wyoming. And uh, it backed out very short notice there. Uh, and and uh, he put out on Twitter, some things are non-negotiable time and health. The truth about the fight is contracts weren't honored, period. Anything else is completely false. I believe if followed long enough, no, I would just back out. Um, and just in as well in this article, it says they're, the company's just days from the company's debut show, the vice president and matchmaker, Paul Tyler, left Uh, so contender bring him one in a uh, former UFC champ, John Hendricks. November 9th on pay-per-view. Get it before the show collapses. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I hope it's not a take the money and run kind of thing. But uh, we'll see. Uh, and of course we had this big buzz this week. News everywhere. Floyd Mayweather is going to fight this guy, a kickboxer named uh, Nasukawa. In a rise and fight promotion, and uh, he's gonna fight this 20-year-old kid who was uh, also a mixed martial artist. So everybody was thinking he was gonna have an MMA fight or a kickboxing match. And uh, this news was everywhere the last few days. And you know, you think Floyd Mayweather was fully on board. Um, and uh, they have Mayweather's quote in one of these articles saying, "I think that he's young, very strong, very fast, and he's undefeated. So it's obvious." He's been doing something right to be where he's at. Uh, so, he also said that this particular bout is a special bout since we're giving people something they've never seen before. The world has never seen Mayweather compete live in Tokyo. I'm going to bring a lot of excitement, and that's really what the people want to see. But then, today, we hear, lo and behold, that the Mayweather where the fight is off. <laughs> Big surprise. Yeah, right. Uh, no go. <laughs> and he's saying he actually never agreed to the fight, which is an even bigger surprise. Especially when you read that, that article. You know, because those exact quotes. that he agreed to it. I mean, maybe his signature isn't on anything yet, but he chucked it up. Maybe some of his advisors came up to him and said, hey, man, you're going to get murdered up there. You might as well call it off and say you never, you never thought of it. You never, you never agreed. Let's see. I'll tell you, um, the two guys that I've seen on Facebook that were the biggest uh, critics of this, uh, one gentleman um, I follow a lot, and uh, his name is Rick Glazer, and I'm not sure if you're friends with him, Rich. Um, he can be a little opinionated sometimes, mm -hmm. um, but, you know, also, also very knowledgeable. And our good friend, Iceman John Scully, Iceman ripped this dread. <laughs> um, yeah, and he has a great point, you know, he goes, you know, nothing more than a money grab. So it's nothing more of, like, tainting the legacy more than anything. It's like, if you're going to come back, you know, because, you know, you can't stay out of the light, fine. It's like, you know, come back against, you know, 
the Spencer's, the Keith Thurman's, uh, the Sean Porter's, guys like that, you know, these young, hungry, you know, uh, fighters, um, the legitimate, you know, um, you know, championship caliber, if not elite caliber yet, fighters, where, you know, it would be, um, you know, a competitive, it would be a match that would be, you know, worth seeing, it would be a risk, you know, um, where this fight would be nothing more than, you know, to be honest, you know, a farce. Yeah. Yeah, and he said it was an exhibition, too. He said the exhibition is off, you know, so there was never any talk of a real fight anyway, so I think maybe everybody was assuming it was going to be a real fight. Maybe that's where things went south, where he was always thinking it was going to be an exhibition. They hooked it as a real fight. And uh, so that's where the lines got crossed. Well, uh, now, what, do you, what, do you guys, what do you guys think it is? Do you think you can get this is the attention? Or there's these money rumors, you know, who knows that. What do you guys think? Well, I mean, I, it, it, honestly, it could, be, it could be a combination of both of them. Uh, because, you know, when you have an ego like that, you know, that is a hard thing to be out of the limelight. I mean, we saw it with other great fighters. You saw it with the Ali's, you saw it with the Sugar Ray Leonard's, but you saw it with the Roy Jones as well. Um, you know, these guys had a hard time stepping away they were so great for so long and that ego does come back and be like you know what I can beat this guy now that's when they were when it was a legitimate boxer um so in this it could be part I want to you know people talking and you figure after you you had the mega fight of the century not that the fight was the mega fight of the century the mega promotion of the century won against Manny Pacquiao and then it's like, where do you go from there? Now, so then, it's, what could top that? Well, a crossover promotion with Conor McGregor. Okay, so you get that. Huge money grab, you know? Um, now it's like, okay, I did that. I did that. Well, if I do this thing over in Japan, this will get people to talk. That's all that. It's getting people to talk. And, um... But, you know, could money be effective there? Hey, when you're spending, you know, $50,000 on a watch, you know, shit adds up. Yeah. 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 He, uh, he does spend a lot of money. Uh, they call that the, oh, yeah. they call that the burn rate when you're dealing with millionaires and billionaires. They're, they're usually burn rate. Uh, the Fertitas won the UFC. I heard their family burn rate was $100 million. Dollars a year. I can believe that's, it. That's just you know, the money they burn, basically. When you have money at such a high, high, high level, you feel that there's no end in sight. Now you're going to get some really smart fighters out there that you know you'll you'll never see brokes. Um, those are the guys like they'll do their investment. Even I'll tell you another sport. This is a good end. Well, any, any really any professional sport, but um, for a good example. Professional wrestling. Professional wrestling, you your top guys can make a really good living. And then you'll, you'll see guys later, you know, after they're pretty much to their stars up, they're wrestling in little armories in front of 100 people or 200 people. They're going to these little shows where they're signing pictures for like $10 each. You know, so they're, you know, really having a, having a hard time because when they were on top of the world, they were like, oh, this will always keep coming in. I'm always going to be making you know, these, you know, hundred, a couple hundred thousand dollar, you know, WrestleMania appearances, or million dollars to WrestleMania appearances. And then it stops. And they've spent so much, you know, they never learn to live within their means. Then you get other guys that are really smart, and they're like, yeah, I'm doing this, but I'm not wasting money while I'm out on the road. I'm not running to the bar every night. I'm not, you know doing this and buying crazy cars and this and that. No, what am I doing? I'm sitting there and I'm investing in some and I'm, you know, um, going modest meals, not these, you know, two, three hundred dollar meals and all that. And they learn how to live within their means and, you know, save their money and, you know, be smart with it. Is Floyd like that? I don't, I don't think so. I do you think I mean, he has some smart people investing money. 
money. Uh, and I think he had a lot to do with Manny Pacquiao signing with uh, Al Heyman. Um, because I think they're going to make that fight happen eventually, but he's just tossing around different ideas as kind of like a stall tactic, and probably also as like a tune-up fight. And I think what happened with this one is he just realized he's in over his head, and uh, and he probably did think it was just going to be an exhibition for fun, and, and uh, you know, like Muhammad Ali's situation there. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> you know, just the publicity stunts, you know, exhibition fight. But, but then it all went to, oh, you know, he's going to have an MMA fight. And he's an undefeated kickboxer, an MMA fighter. And, yeah. You know, so he probably just said, hey, whoa, wait a second. Yeah, I just said I was going to do an exhibition. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Whoa, slow down. So, yeah, for a second there, I was like, well, maybe he has been secretly training in MMA, and then it came out that, that he's called it off, and I said, well, yeah, that makes sense. So, who the hell would sign up for that as just a pure boxer? Uh, and Ryzen has never done a boxing match, pure boxing match, as far as I know, so that would be weird. <laughs> but anyway, it's off. So Mayweather's uh, Japanese passport has been revoked. Just kidding. <laughs> Although, I, I do have to say, I was happy to hear that uh, Jim Acosta's press pass was revoked. <laughs> See him <laughs> shifting gears over there. Uh, that guy is such a you putz. And the way we all are, you know, media guys, too. Um, you know, and I, I remember studying journalism. I was in first class, sophomore year in Lock Haven, and basically learning that media... <laughs> And this was, it caught me by surprise, because I was a kid growing up watching the news and, you know, what you saw in the news was true when it was the news, and learning how things could really be manipulated, and the same story could come at two different ways. And I remember my first class, Intro to, um, intro to Communications, it, it floored me. And I, I remember it was right after um, JFK's boy, Jack had died, and they were showing, they were covering the reporters covering it. And these guys are sitting there saying, man, like, wouldn't it be great if like, they dropped the casket and it opened? Because that would give me a great shot. This would, give, this would be great to see. And I'm sitting there going, oh, my God, this is, this is terrible. <laughs> um, but at the same time, it's like, you know, Tom and I can watch the same thing. Tom and I can sit next to each other. Rich, you and I can sit next to each other. And, you know, we can go in there and just say, for example, you know, Floyd fighting McGregor. Now, I'm a boxing guy, and you're a mixed martial arts guy. You know, so we go in there, and I'm going in there on the, you know, um, with the bias towards boxing guy. Boy, you're going in there with the bias towards the MMA guy, McGregor. So I spin it how, in the first few rounds, we toying with them and drawing them into deep water, and then eventually he's going to, you know, beat them up where you could be spinning it where McGregor's pressure is really making Floyd uncomfortable, he's winning rounds, you know, he's he's doing more against Floyd than Manny Pacquiao and other trained boxers did. And the, so when anybody that did not watch that fight, if they read my article, it was Floyd we'll toyed with them, you know, took them to the deepers and drowned them. And then they read yours where it's McGregor forced the fight. Like he made Floyd uncomfortable. He gave him a lot of rough moments. He was winning the fight, and then uh, late he he got caught, and the, they got they stopped the fight. So it, you learn how media can make things the way they they want to. I got one guy I read sometimes, and and he he's a friend of mine, but you know he definitely goes in there with a bias. So you have to, and even guys that are friends, as I say. He's a good reporter, and he, he makes his stories interesting, but to take everything with a grain of salt because he goes in there with a predetermined mindset. And if he likes you, he'll make you look like gold. If he doesn't like you, he'll make you look like shit. He <laughs> was a, a an anti-Manny Pacquiao guy for the longest time. Did not like Pacquiao. Could not stand Pacquiao. And every fight that Pacquiao was having, and this is when Pacquiao was in that great run from, say, like, 09 to about 2012-ish, every fight, he put out a prediction that Pacquiao 
Pacquiao would lose. Then when Pacquiao didn't lose, and I'll tell you the fight that was um um um, um, um it was he was fighting it was fighting the guy from, I think from Ghana. Um, I want I keep wanting to say Joseph Abedko, but I don't believe that's the right name. Um, but this was a guy with big, strong, tough, physical guy. And but Pacquiao got him on his heels early, and never and the guy never got his hands off. And Pacquiao just I mean beat him up on his way to the decision. He called it a fight fix because the guy he picked to win by knockout lost every round and got his ass kicked. Uh-huh. Called fight fix because he couldn't give a good you know um basically spin on why he was so wrong. Right. Yeah, some people, you know, they just want to spin it their own way. Oh, yeah. Make everything look like a conspiracy against them. But, you know, another rule that you learn in usually your first journalism class or your first year of journalism is that you never make yourself part of the story. And I've seen more of that from CNN than I've seen from any other organization in the media. And it's like, you know, you can be Democrat and, you know, be fine with me, but when you're to that level, just ripping everything the president does, just to rip it, and just spend the amount of coverage they spend on just sitting there ripping him, and, and just, you know, tearing apart everything he does, and then, and then even when they're giving him a compliment, it's backhanded, and it's, oh, well, why isn't he talking about how great the economy is when he's doing all these speeches in, in an election thing? Why is he focusing on the caravan? Well, he is talking about the economy, too. They're just not giving him credit for even doing that. Anyway, that's my rant. <laughs> See, and, yeah, it's, I watch it a lot. You know, I used to be a faithful watcher, too, and, 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 and like really kind of thought they were a great organization until this presidency. I mean, it's just, like, are you kidding me? Like, they just, they're bad. And the worst was when they, uh, they had their reporters with the bomb threat, the guy, the MAGA bomber. The, uh-huh. They did a story on how their reporters continued to report the news on their cell phones. Like they were heroes. Like, go fuck yourself. <laughs> you're not part of the story. Get over it. You know, just, you're doing your job. Nobody should give you a high five, even. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so that's, well, high five is doing what you're supposed to do. Right. Going above and beyond the call of duty because you use your cell phone to. Fucking do the news. Get the hell out of here. Like, it wasn't even a real bomb. I mean, the thing was like a friggin' contraption. <clears throat> so, anyway. That's, that's how they, you can kind of see through it, you know. No matter what, whether you're a Republican or a Democrat, you have to see that kind of stuff and just be like, that's just not journalism. That's, that's puffing up your own team like they're awesome. You know, the predetermined mindset is you know, damaging. Yeah. And this one thing you didn't hear yeah, on the it, news. It, it just destroys credibility, too. Because right. you know what he's going to say, and if he says something that's, that's true, and you hate him so much, you don't have to listen. <laughs> anyway. Uh, one thing you didn't hear on CNN is that uh, an Italian fighter, uh, boxer, has tr- tragically died after a title fight in Bangkok. A uh, 49-year-old oh. former Muay Thai champion and... Uh, also champion in boxing. Uh, he was fighting for a title that was, I guess, worth dying for, the WBC Asia title. Uh, he was put in a coma due to his injuries. Uh, and this was a guy that uh, pretty much was going to die in the ring, so, from what it sounds like, because he, he had plans to box until he was 80. This is no joke. That's what he told Italian wow. media. Uh, or his brother, brother and manager, said to Italian media, uh, Christian died as he wanted to die. That is in the ring. He dreamed of fighting until he was 80 years old. Uh, and wow. he had fought more than 200 professional fights and won a total of seven world titles in Muay Thai and boxing. Um, surprisingly, his boxing record isn't in here. But, but he, uh, unfortunately, he's behind a five-year-old daughter and his wife. Uh, 49 years old. All life. <clears throat> but, uh, yeah. 
That's what happens when you push it too far. Floyd. <laughs> yeah. No, uh, I don't think Floyd's going to die in the ring. I, I do think the Manny Pacquiao fight is probably his best option right now, though, money-wise. Uh, Khabib's never going to get into the boxing ring because Dana White won't let him. Even though Dana White's out there saying he's building this big boxing thing, he's not going to do that. Uh, here's an odd boxing story for you, Tony. Um, have you ever heard of a uh, boxing uh, major bo boxing match being stopped due to a back injury? Other than Mike Tyson saying, I broke my back! Um, I mean, specifically, no. <laughs> uh, but, I mean, it's not out of the realm of, you know, possibility. I mean, because I know just a in the sparring session, I hurt my back real bad one time uh, in 1995. And trust me, if it would have and that was thankfully was the last punch of the last round. Because if I would have had to go any further, I don't know how much longer I could have gone. Um, so, it's, yeah, not out of the realm of realism, I'll tell you that. <laughs> well, I mean, uh, yep. this guy. Other injuries, shoulder injuries, knee injuries, hand injuries, uh, a back injury, um, it doesn't, you know, surprise me. Uh, Nonito Donaire, we talked about this fight last week, uh, back in action. He was uh, over in the UK uh, and fighting a guy that was, uh, you know, the hometown guy, Ryan Burnett. He had to surrender his WBA Bantamweight title. He sustained a fight injury, ending back injury. And this was during the World Boxing Super Series quarterfinal match, too, so there's a lot on the line here. Uh, 35 year old Nonito Donair takes the belts, and uh, he's already a four weight world champion. He's going to face South African WBO title holder Zolami Tete in the semifinals. And uh, after the round, Burnett could be heard telling his trainer, Adam Booth, I cannot move it, I cannot throw a sh shot. He dropped to his knees in the next round after attempting to throw a punch and pulled out of the fight. That's conclusions. Uh, so, that's it. Uh, he was ahead on all judges' cards, cards though, when the fight was ended, which is kind of unfortunate. Um, and this guy, uh, Donaire, had not fought at 118 pounds for seven years, so, you know, if he hadn't maintained his uh, full health there, you never know how it would have gone, but it looks like he could have won it. Uh, but he appeared, um, he appeared to be unfazed when they got cornered by Donaire at one point, and uh, he got hit with some shots and combinations. Um, and uh, there was also the situation with uh, Donaire's last opponent being Carl Frampton, who was a friend of uh, Burnett. Very, uh... Anyway, Donaire was the bigger man at Bantamweight, and he did work walking down a lot, but it was just uh, a little bit more of a slick style, I guess, until the back injury. But I was carrying him on the scorecards. Anyway, he's going to get some medic further medical assessment, and we'll see what happens. Uh, the promoter said in a post-fight press conference that he had slipped a disc in his back. But we'll find out. Anyway, that's an odd one. I had never heard of a back injury ending a fight like that. Uh, have you guys heard anything about this Stefan Bonner? Do you know why? Anything? I have not. Uh, this is yeah, a sad story. This is uh, the best thing we used to do. We used to do every now and then the MMA or the combat sports bad boy. Well, this guy is a legend in the ring, in the cage, uh, but uh, now he is a legend on the highway for all the wrong reasons. He's the bad boy of the, the month, I think, with this one. So, okay. Um, first of all, the crazy part about this is, okay, you've got an MMA fighter who's drunk and driving. So what do you do? Uh, cops don't even get there before Stephen Barter is tied to his steering wheel by innocent bystanders who uh, cornered him driving erratically. Got him tied to his steering wheel and 
and the key's taken away, apparently. <laughs> and, uh, so... I have that mental image. <laughs> you know, I just have that mental image, and... Uh, I shouldn't be I laughing, because it's really not a funny anything. matter, but it, it is sort of funny when you imagine. Uh, they actually have the body cam footage of after they untied him, and they're trying to get him out of the vehicle, and he's still sort of resisting, and, and they have the guys that stop to help and, and restrain him. Help the cops put the cuffs on <laughs> Stephen Barr. One of the guys says, you picked the wrong guy to mess with. <laughs> uh, but anyway. What a mugshot. Uh, did you see his mugshot? I haven't seen his mugshot, but I mean, it was all over the oh. links in the MMA media, and I finally looked at it to see the body cam footage, in, and I read the story, and I did not realize it was that crazy of a story. But uh, he was charged with a lot, <laughs> a lot of charges. Uh, let's see. Uh, let's see what we've got a list here. Resisting a public official, unsafe starting or movement of a stopped vehicle. Uh, he was initially held on $22,000 bail, at least Monday. This was his third DUI offense. So, um, before the act, the, before the, the arrest, multiple people called 911 about uh, his vehicle, a red Cadillac CTS being driven in a reckless manner. Carlos said the driver, they later found out to be Bonner, was going more than 90 miles per hour with unsafe lane changes. And then uh, the highway patrol was responding. More calls came in that citizens surrounded the vehicle, forcing him to stop. The first trooper to respond reported that Bonner had been physically restrained by fellow motorists and appeared to be incoherent. Uh, and Bonner can be seen with both hands tied onto his car with orange cords in the body cam video. Uh, and, and I don't see that in the body cam video on this one. Maybe they edited that out, but you can see a guy standing beside the passenger door with orange cord in his hand. So, <laughs> that's believable. Oh, that's astonishing. Uh, yeah. Obviously, he smelled like alcohol. Uh, medical staff reported to the scene and determined nothing medically was abnormal with the driver. Uh, he hasn't fought since the Tito Ortiz fight under Bellator's banner in 2014, and of course he's best known for the Forrest Griffin fight. Uh, in the finals of the Ultimate Fighter 1, called by many the best bout in MMA history, put really the UFC on the map in a lot of ways, but um, yeah. It was the, definitely the DUI, the most interesting DUI in history there. <laughs> in this situation in Vegas. Yes, right near Vegas. Uh, Nevada Highway Patrols. Some stories still on that one, but you know it's it's also not a funny matter in a lot of ways because you have to look at it when you deal with a fighter in this situation, like any football player, you know, anybody in the spotlight and uh, has a reputation for being a badass. Number one, everybody wants to buy you a beer. Number two, um, you know, you have to wonder about the amount of fighters and people in public media and the public eye who have addiction problems, you know. So you have to have kind of, kind of a little bit of concern for that. And then your decision-making aspects of, you know, the brain damage that you might be taking from a long fight career could play a factor in some of the decisions that, you know, you, hey, get, get behind the wheel. So not to forgive them, but, you know, there are some factors involved here that uh, a lot of fighters struggle with a lot of big public figures struggle with and uh, we hope he gets help and straightens his shit out because I'm sure this is a life lesson for him, you know, getting his ass kicked by a bunch of complete strangers <laughs> on the freeway. On that, no, yeah. I've got to fly out to Vegas on December, in December for that. So <laughs> a meeting with the fighters on their lawsuit. Um, we also have some events to talk about, of course. Boxing. MMA. And of course, the big uh, UFC fight. I do have a couple more news stories I'm going to hit up, though. This one just came today. Uh, we, we just heard about the trade 
between now one championship and UFC Ben Askren for Demetrius Johnson. And uh, now we have uh, former champion Misha Tate is the vice president for one championship now. Uh, I believe this was a title formerly held by Rich Franklin. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, but yeah, she is uh, stepping in, and uh, this is this is good stuff. You know, she had some very critical commentary about Dana White, and I loved. And uh, there she is uh, joining the competition. So good for her. She is now the VP. Uh, also, uh, another guy retiring from boxing, Yoshihiro Kamagai. Step away. From the fight game, completely. Japanese Junior Weight says his physical decline is what prompted the decision. The former world title contender at Junior Middleweight officially announced his retirement at age 35. Ends his career with a record 7 5 and 2 with 24 knockouts. And this is his exact quote I'm retiring from boxing. My last two bouts, I've been losing power in my arms in the early rounds, unlike before. To throw more power punches throughout the whole fight. Now I can't. Back when I fought Robert Guerrero and Jiso Carras, these, those were fights when my performance was at best, but the last two was far from it. I didn't feel like I was in my body, but still I was more humble than appreciative ever to see the fans all around the world crossing different countries to cheer me on. That was my pride and motivation to all the fans that supported me throughout my boxing career. My biggest appreciation goes out to all of you. Thank you very much. Oh. And uh, speaking of uh, Karras, I think he's on tonight. Either ESPN or FS1, like 11 o'clock, so I'm long asleep, but... What is it? What, what's that? Uh, speaking of Mr. Soto Car Karras, uh, oh. he's fighting tonight. Um, televised, I forget if it's ESPN or FS1, but um, he's on it tonight, 11 o'clock. I probably won't be awake to see it, but... All right. <laughs> Well, that must be one of the ones that I didn't uh, call up because uh, I just clicked on Saturday. But uh, let's check that out. Uh, here's an interesting one: Arislandi Lara. Okay, he's, he's uh, some a little bit of controversy has followed him from time to time. He's uh, been removed from the WBC ratings after he's opted out of their clean boxing program. What does that mean? Um, he has requested. Yep. That's a, that's a good question. And what does that mean when not only has he been removed, but he's been requested that he be remo removed? Uh, so, he was rated at number two at 154 pounds. And, and uh, was thought to be closing in on another world title opportunity. But he's got to juice some more. I mean, he's got to... Uh, <laughs> he's... I don't know. Uh, he's just basically... Uh, says, this is the first time a boxer has resigned from the program, according to the WBC. Uh, WBC has an agreement with BADA, which is the Voluntary Anti-Doping Association. They administer the clean boxing program, and uh, BADA coordinates the collection of samples, the chain of custody, and the analysis in laboratories. The WBC is only in charge of the results. So, they said uh, they regret the decision of Eris Londi Lara and wish him success in the future. But, uh, yeah, you're not rated anymore with us. And uh, more power to the WBC for doing this in the first place. But, uh, Uh, anyway, so we've got uh, I'll check on tonight in a minute here, but we've got a lot of stuff going on on Saturday.
Fight. Uh, this might be our preliminary mismatch of the week. A one fight card from Chile. Velasquez, 22-6-2 at Bantamweight. And Abel Leandro Silva, 5-3. and three. This is a fight in Chile. 22-6 versus 5-1. A little bit of a mismatch. Probably not the worst we've seen. These are results, I should say. So that was the mismatch, and the guy that uh, was having one lost. <laughs> oh, it's a mismatch of last week. This is last Saturday's place. Uh, where is that? One? All right, we had uh, we had this. We talked about this one last week, I believe. Timo Schwarzkopf, because I said maybe he's related to Norman. He uh, yeah. took the win in this one. He improves to 19 and 2 over Florin Cardos, who falls to 19 and 2. <laughs> uh, so they both get the same record now. Uh, and that one was for the EBU Super Lightweight title. As I said, uh, Ryan Burnett lost to Nonito Donaire. And we had a few other good fights on that card. We had uh, Josh Taylor undefeated at 13-0, staying undefeated, going to 14-0 over Ryan Martin, who was 22-0, but is now 22-1. That's for the, that was for the WBC Silver Super Lightweight title, so Taylor takes that one home. Uh, Zach Parker, another somebody that was going to go fight, takes the win at super middleweight. He is 17-0 now. That's uh, the BBB of C, British super middleweight title. Darrell Williams takes the loss. He falls to 17-1. and one. And then we had, we had somebody going postal, Victor. He got his uh, 30th win. Big milestone for him to go two losses. And uh, he beat Sire Oswald, who falls to 14-2. and two. Also, uh, Paul Butler got a big win. He goes to 27-2 as Bantamweight uh, over Yon Boyo, who falls to 41-6. and six. Crazy. Very good record. Well, Jesus lost the Jesus fight of the week. Looks like no miracles there in Montebello, California. Abraham. Jesus and Abraham. How about that for a biblical fight? <laughs> That's a battle of the Bible. <laughs> well, to wait. Abraham 10 1 1. Abraham Lopez beat Jesus Cruz Viviano, who falls to 17 and 14. There was a surprise there. No surprise at all. Alright. We had, uh, let's see. Sullivan Barrera beating Sean Monahan in the main event in a New York, New York fight here. Doesn't say anything about the promoters for some reason. Uh, but yeah, Sullivan Barrera improves to 22 and 2. Sean Monahan uh, gets his second loss to go with 29 wins. He was in his 30th, didn't get it. Uh, and Dennis Duggan, who he was a former guest of ours, uh, 21 and 6, beat Saul Roman. Yeah, we talked about this fight last week too. Falls to 43 and 13. <coughs> so Doug gets his 22nd one right there. And not Cassius Clay, but Cassius Cheney. 
at heavyweight improved to 14-0 over Santino Turnbow, who was just four and two go in. And then we had uh, another Roman fight. A lot of Romans fighting this weekend. Uh, over in El Paso, Texas, Miguel Burchelt improved to 35 and one with a win over Miguel Roman. Close to 60 wins, 13 losses. That one was for the WBC World Super Featherweight title. And the coming event there, Miguel Mariaga, 26 and 3 going in. This is 27th win over Jose Estrella, who falls to 20 wins, 15 losses, and 1 draw. That's the last week fights. Tony said there's some, some ESPN fights tonight, so let's go. I just saw the paper this morning. And it's Jesus Soto Carrasco is the main event. Um, I didn't really didn't get a chance to look at it much, unfortunately. But three minutes on my way out to work today. But no, it's a fight on Saturday. Let me see if I can find anything. Having a job, I couldn't get my afternoon nap in, <laughs> which is a prerequisite. All right, so here it is. Uh, Oscar De La Hoya promoting, of course, Golden Boy. Uh, this one's from California. That's why it's at 11 o'clock, probably. Uh, Nico Macias in the main event at Super Welterweight against Jesus. So, obviously, this has got to be our Jesus fight of the week. So, it's the night of our show, and Jesus is fighting. So, so be. Jesus comes in at 28, 13, and 4. And Jesus has had a rough last six outings because he only had one draw to highlight them. <laughs> so Jesus may need a miracle to give Nico his first loss. And then we have a co-main event of Emilio Sanchez, 16-1, and one, uh, fighting Enrique Bernache, who is 24-11. and 11. Um, I wonder if Emilio's nickname is Dirty. <laughs> Emilio Dirty Sanchez. Not good. No. Uh, Jose Santos Gonzalez also on the party. He's 23 and 6 at featherweight, fighting Manny Robles the third, who's undefeated at 16 and 0. Uh, we got super middleweight Demetrius Ballard undefeated at 18 and 0, and Alan Campa 17 and 3. And that's it. That's it. Pretty really good stuff. Not a whole lot of other stuff going on tonight. So uh, let's get to Saturday. Is all right for fighting the tenth? Uh, we got a UFC fight card to talk about as well. Um, Saturday afternoon. All right. Uh, in Argentina, Cordoba, Argentina. We got a guy named Cordoba fighting. How did that happen? That's like a guy, a guy from Boston named Boston fighting. Uh, Javier Jose Clavero is his opponent. Uh, 24 and 4 at lightweight. Uh, the South American lightweight titles on the line. Carlos Daniel Cordoba. He is 10 and 3. And this is in Cordoba, Argentina. That's funny. Maybe his uh, relatives founded the city. Now here's a weird one from New South Wales. Australia. We've got Joel Brunker coming in at Super Featherweight. He has a crazy record of 33-3. and three, Fighting Revo Rengkung, whose record is 37 wins, 27 losses, and 6 draws. Main event. Well, all he needs is another draw, then we'll have a bunch of 7s going there, huh? Right. <laughs> 37, 27, 7. <laughs> And here's one for the Brazilian heavyweight title. Uh, Leandro Rufino, 6-0, fighting Pedro Otas, who's 32-4. and Crazy difference. Uh, and I've got some mismatches of the month here. Gilberto Macias Domingos, 21-9, versus Juarez Florentino Costa Jr., who's 4-0. It's not so much of a mismatch. This one is Edson Roberto Dos Santos Borges. Comes in at 29, 3 and 2, fighting Josue Dos Santos, who's just 1 and 4. 1 and 4. He 
you might as well be named Jesus. Just way. All right, uh, Dominican Republic has some good fights, believe it or not. Jackson Marina is at lightweight the main event, 14-0. Fighting uh, another Jesus, Jesus Arvelo, 27-3-1. A good Jesus fighting for the WBA Fed Latin lightweight title. And uh, yeah, that's, it's not on TV or anything, but it's in the Dominican Republic. Co-main event, Hector Luis. Garcia, 9-0, fighting Robin Zamora, 13-4. We're going to send Tony as a correspondent to this one. I don't think okay. gonna, uh, you can work from the beach, right? He's got to fight out. He's got to cover the Jesus fight of the week. got to get it in the budget. All right. Want to see behave? Yeah. And we also have uh, a fight here. Dahiana Santana, France. He's 36 and nine, fighting Ocean Deriu, who's nine and zero for the WBF World Female Super Lightweight Title. Those are females. Uh, over in Bayern, Germany, we got a main event. Wanik Audjan, 23 and one, fighting Mano Ali, who is. Eight, two, and one. Right. Where's the good stuff? They always put the good stuff at the bottom. Uh, here's one in Mexico. They're not the only fight in Mexico this weekend, but uh, this is a big one. Sort of. WBC Mundo Hispano. Super friendly. Wait, title. That's a new one. Uh, Yasmin Rivas, 38 and 10 with one draw, fighting Christina Del Val Pacheco, 11 and 11 with two draws for the WBA World Female Super Fan title. Um, and we got Jackie Nava, 34, 4 and 3, fighting Carolina Alvarez, 14, 9 and 4. On that card. And another Jesus fight. Jesus. This is Jesus weekend. Jesus Cervantes at Villanueva. 5-2 and two, fighting Joselito Velasquez, who's 6-0. Right. Uh, as I was mentioning before, Andres Gutierrez fighting also in Mexico. 36-2-1 fighting Ramiro Blanco. 18-3-3 for the vacant WBC Mundo Hispano Super Featherweight title. Main event in there, Isaac Cruz Gonzalez, 15 and 1, fighting Jose Felix Jr., 36-3 Oh man. That's some weird religion stuff coming up in this box yeah. <laughs> discussion. So there's a fight in the Philippines very under under this other one that we just talked about. And uh, the, the co main event fighter is a minimum weight named Melvin Jerusalem. <laughs> wow. He's 13 and 2. Fighting Toto. Toto, Dorothy's dog. Toto Landero is uh, 10, 3, and 2. Toto versus Jerusalem. Too weird. All right. Uh, another big fight going on. Uh, Arthur Spilka in action in uh, Poland. Bad places. 21 and 3. Fighting Marius Wach, who is 33 and 3. Somebody three's got to gotta go there. Uh, that's the main event. And then we uh, also have uh, Dmitry Sukotsky. He is a 23 and 6 fighting Pavel Stepien, who is 11 and 0. That's for the Republic of Poland International light heavyweight title. Uh, and then we got a female fight. Uh, Iwa Piatkowska, 11 and 1, fighting Ornella Danini, 13 and 1, for the WBC World Female. World Tour title. And if that ain't enough, we got Maj Suleki. He is 26 and 1 middleweight fighting Gene Michael Hamilcaro, who is 26, 9, and 3. Alright. I'll talk about those ones. Those pesky Russians. <laughs> Uh, 
Uh, so, Alexander Usyk versus Tony Ballou in the United Kingdom in Lancashire. That's the one for a lot of titles here. The International Boxing Federation World Cruiserweight title. I mean, that, that's a competitive matchup right there. Yeah. Usyk is 15 and 0. Ballou is 32 and 1. 30 wins, 2 losses, 1 draw. Uh, IBF World Cruiserweight title. WBA. Super World Cruiserweight title, WBC World Cruiserweight title, and WBO World Cruiserweight titles all on the line there. Uh, and Anthony Rock and Roll Croa also on the card. He's 33, 6 and 3, fighting Dodd Jordan, who's 38 and 3. Uh, right, that's not enough stackage. We've got Ricky Burns, 42, 7 and 1, fighting Scott Carter, who's 23, 2. And then way down on the card at Cruiserweight, we also have another title. Sam Hyde, 13-0-1, fighting Richard Rhea Capore, 7-0 for the vacant WBA Intercontinental Cruiserweight title. Oh, say that one ten times fast. Uh, your Yorkis Gamboa. This is a blast from the past. He's in action uh, in Florida. And it's not the Jesus fight of the week. But it's the Jesus Matchmaker of the week, Ruben de de Jesus, de, de Jesus. He's a day Jesus. He's not a night Jesus. <laughs> night Jesus takes over. It's dusk. Your <laughs> uh, York is Gamboa main event at lightweight. He's twenty eight and two, fighting Miguel Beltran, thirty three and six. Uh, and we got Juan Manuel Lopez, thirty five and six, fighting. Christian Ruben Amino, who is 19 and 2. Lightweight. Uh, and then what awaits Harold Calderon, undefeated at 11 and 0. Now 17 and 0, fighting Emiliano Martin Garcia, who is 16 and 2. And uh, we got another De Jesus, Jorge De Jesus Romero, 11 and 0 at Super Bantamweight, fighting Jason Vera, who is 5 and 5. And of course, another Jesus fighter of the week. What awaits Jesus Almonte, 4 and 0. One draw fighting Sonny Duderson, who is 3 0 oh, 2. Alright, now Chicago. Um, our former guest, Leon Margulis, talked about one of his uh, fighters' most controversial fights. Uh, I'm sure with us. Uh, he is back in uh, Chicago for a big one. Uh, Maurice Bradis, 24 and 1, fighting Noel Givon. 23 and 1. No title on the line there, but uh, another cruiserweight title on the line in the coming event. Christoph Wolacki, 30 wins, 1 loss. Fighting Maxime Vlasov, who's 42 and 2. That one's for the interim WBO World Cruiserweight title. And then, how about this for a fighter name? Cruiserweight Archer Man. He's the man. 14 and 0. Fighting Alexei Zubov, who is 17 and 1. So that rounds out the big, big names on the card. Uh, I don't know where, why this isn't on TV somewhere, but probably it is. It just doesn't list it on Box Trek. <laughs> right. There's too many Jesuses fighting, and I got to cover those. And, and we talked about a boxer retiring. Uh, now we're going to talk about a MMA fighter retiring with a pretty, pretty big name and a pretty big story because that's his name, Rick Story. He is uh, closing the book on, on his career at the age of 34. Uh, announced it today. He had a loss at uh, a promotion called PFL 10 on October 20th. And he says, I'm writing this to announce my retirement from, from professional MMA. It's been a career with significant highs and lows through the good and bad times. My goals were the, what drove me, and the fans were always my inspiration for this. I thank all of you. To my family and others who have supported me along this journey, I thank you for always being there and for showing me that there is more to life after fighting. So, yeah. <clears throat> so that's another uh, big time record uh, fighter. He actually did very well in the UFC. He uh, had a record of 12 and 7. He won three of his last four bouts with the promotion and uh, beat fighters like Gunnar Nelson, Tarek Safadine. 
He earned uh, rare double bonuses when he tapped out of Brian Foster at UFC 103 in 2009, winning submission of the night and fight of the night. And then, uh, he actually left the uh, organization despite them offering him an extension, believe it or not. Choosing to sign with PFL to pursue the million dollar prize in their inaugural welterweight tournament. So this is the PFL that just started. Uh, Professional Fighters League, where they have the tournament at the end. So you might see this a lot with fighters that enter in this just to try to win the money at the end, and they don't get the money, so they just hang it up. <coughs> so this might be the, you know, a last stand type of place for a lot of these guys, which could make it interesting, could make it kind of have a bad rap. So we'll, we'll see if this perpetuates itself. Uh, Rick Story was no cheap date, as Tom likes to say. Tough guy. So that's it. And we've got, uh, of course, the recap of UFC 230 to talk about, Tom. And um, you talk about boxing and MMA and how, how weak it can be. Uh, all it takes a little, little time on the shelf. And you see what, uh, what I always harp on, weak defense. How that comes back to haunt the fighter was doing well, and another guy just happens to have good chin. He doesn't have good defense either. <laughs> he just lands the right punch, and uh, like I, I always talk about the, when I talk about the punch on the chin that knocks somebody out. I always re re resort to uh, this white collar boxing series that we had the the uh, inventors. Uh, creators on the show and the participants who were actually boxing each other at the end of it. And they had this guy from Harvard on there and he had this thing with these monkeys, right? And these monkeys had these contraptions on their head that would twist their heads violently and they would pass out. <laughs> and it was, you know, supposedly to show what happens when you have a concussion and your brain slaps against the side of your head. So, you know, they were trying to relate it to boxing. And I got it, you know, I just tried to kind of explain it on the show when we first saw it. But it was fascinating because, I mean, you think about every shot to the chin where a guy's head twists violently to the side. I mean, it instantly puts you out. It's a switch. So, uh, Chris Weedman was pretty much winning all three rounds up till 246 in the third round. And he got hit with one of those punches right on the chin. And he went sideways a bit, and then got more punches, and he was all done. And Ronaldo Souza, I mean, you have to give him credit for hanging in there, but he was getting pummeled. He was he had a, you know, pretty bad puffed up face, and like a broken nose, and it was just like looked like the beginning and the end, and then he just started zombie fighting, and it was over. <laughs> and, uh, and how about that stop, huh? Yeah, it's beautiful. Uh, and then he got yeah, so pissed at the ref because the ref didn't stop it in yeah. time, and legitimately so. You know, he, he doesn't. He, that's a very, very good sportsman right there. You know, just trying to be real, fair. Real good. I mean, he was. It was obvious to everyone in the arena and everyone watching except one guy. I need to stop it. Uh -huh. uh, yeah, that reminded me of. Uh, a great boxing match, and you know why Tony likes the standing eight count. Because <laughs> even though there wasn't a standing eight count here, it was like, wow, you know, it was that type of a comeback. The guy could have got a standing eight count if he was in boxing. His he was getting beat up so bad, <clears throat> and uh, he just he just turned it around. Sort of like yeah, the beast I, did in his I, last I, fight. I, 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 think, I think that old cliche: uh, the ref could have the house. <laughs> yeah, it was bad. And you got to feel for Chris Weedman, you know, it's uh, it's a tough, it's a tough thing to do, going, going back oh, after it's, it's, it's just loss, de I devastating for him. I mean, it's a horrible back. <laughs> and believe it or not, leading up to that, he had a picture-perfect jab. He was landing it beautifully. He was kind of reminding me of the old cat toy with the mouse, you know, that analogy. Just playing around almost. Uh, he he was just landing it so easily, and then it just it came back to him. He got so cocky with it, he just started dropping his hands, and that's all it takes is one shot. 
So, that'll be a lesson to you kids training in combat sports. Keep your damn hands up. Keep them up. Uh, anyway. Mm, keeping his hands up didn't help, help Derek Lewis out in his fight in the main event with Daniel Cormier because he got submitted by a rear choke. Took out uh, 2 minutes and 14 seconds into the second round and uh, Daniel Cormier pretty much uh, handily took care of him. So it was uh, a pretty easy fight for him. Didn't look like he was challenged much at all. Uh, but hey, I think we all expected that. <laughs> It would have been harder to predict uh, Ronaldo Souza getting the win there. Anyway. Uh, we also had Jared Cannonier getting a vicious TKO over uh, David Branch. Just under 30 seconds into the second round there. Uh, and Carl Roberson beat Jack Marshman by an unanimous decision. Uh, Israel Adesanya beat Derek Brunson by TKO. From knees and punches. That yeah, was, he uh, looked great. Pretty decent uh, performance by Israel, and uh, just kind of weathered, weathered him down, made him quit, basically, or made a ref stop it, and uh, good stuff. We also had uh, Jordan Ronaldi beating Jason Knight by unanimous decision. Sajara Eubanks beating Roxanne Modafferi uh, by unanimous. decision. Decision that was uh, kind of a tough one to watch. Roxanne kind of got thrown around, but she was, she was fighting tough till the end. Uh, it's just unfortunate she's got no power behind her punches. You know, she was actually kind of putting stuff together towards the end of the fight. But she just does not have the power. She's got a great, great boxing coat, but just just does not have enough oomph behind those shots. Not much you can do there. Anyway, Shaman Marais beat Julio Arce by split. Decision. Lyman Good beat Ben Saunders by knockout. One minute and 32 seconds into the first. Matt Frivola and Lando Venata fought to a majority draw. Second fight of the night, Shane Burgos beat Kurt Holobaugh by armbar. Two minutes and 11 seconds into the fight. And Marcos Rogerio de Lima beat Adam Wikorzek in the first fight of the night by unanimous decision. We got uh, UFC Fight Night 139, the Korean Zombie in the main event. Fighting, uh, I believe, newly reacquired Yair Rodriguez. Is that who it is? This is Rodriguez. Hang on. Yair Rodriguez, 10 and 2. This is the guy that was famously uh, getting ready to leave the UFC. They signed him back to fight one particular guy, and he backed out of the fight <laughs> due to injury, I believe. So now he's fighting somebody else. So Chen Sung who is fourteen and four. Yeah, you're ten and two. Uh, also in fight, uh, Cardonald Cerrone looking for a win. Thirty-three and eleven fighting Mike Perry, who's twelve and three. Another guy who's not famous for his defense. So let's see how he does here. Good scrapper, but very, very poor defense. So he takes a lot of risks to get in there and slug out, slug it out with people. Uh, uh, Raquel Pennington also on the card. She's nine and six, fighting Jermaine De Randami, seven and three. Well, Darius fourteen four and one, fighting Tiago Moises, who is eleven two. Macy Barber five and zero, oh, fighting Ashley Yoder, not fighting uh, Hannah Cipher, who is eight and two. Michael Trezano, 7-0, fighting Luis Pena, who's 5-0. Amanda Bobby Cooper, 3-4, fighting Ashley Yoder, who's 5-4 as well. No, Amanda is 3-4, sorry. Chas Skelly, 17-3, fighting Bobby Moffat, who's 13-3. John Gunter, 5-0, fighting Davey Ramos, 8-2. Julian Arosa, 22-5, fighting Devontae Smith, who's 8-1. Joseph Morales, 9-1, fighting Eric. Shelton, 11-5. Mark De La Rosa, 10-1, fighting Joby Sanchez, who's 11-3. We got one championship, Heart of the Lion, also taking place this weekend. Uh, not a whole lot of names we've ever heard of, but uh, the main event, Biblio, Bibiano Fernandez, 22-3, fighting Kevin Billingon, who is 19-5, and then the main event, 
Christian Lee, 9 and 3, fighting Kazuki Tokodomi, who is 18, 9 and 1. And about does it for stuff we got to cover. Unless you guys got anything else to add. Um, no, I mean, you know, it's just not, not the biggest week. I was a little surprised. Usually in November we start getting, you know, uh, a rush quite for the holidays, but not, not, not as much as I was hoping for. Right. Well, we'll see. I'm sure there'll be another Floyd Mayweather announcement within the next week. Now that Japan <laughs> turns off. I'm sure that. But, um, yeah, yeah, it's kind of a little bit of a slow week. But, you know, it, it is what it is. Sometimes we got some lulls. But, um, yeah, uh, you know, we got Thanksgiving coming up. I'm sure there'll be some fights around that. And, and then, uh, of course, we got the big movie coming up. Tony's movie coming up. Uh, Twelve days away, baby. I'll watch some of the new trailers. We're gonna have Tony's uh, not gonna be available. He's gonna be signing autographs after I that know. movie. It's a hundred dollars a pop. No, he better be available, Tony. <laughs> don't forget where your, your main priorities are, buddy. <laughs> I know it's gonna be I another know. life for you, but uh, don't lose your roots, okay? <laughs> <laughs> He's gonna be on the press oh, tour. Uh, I forgot to mention tomorrow night. Um, um. Tomorrow night was going to be the um, the fight that I was going to have uh, the exhibition, which fell through unfortunately. But I am invited to a party for um, Hank Cesaro's 95th birthday, so I'm looking forward to that and uh, going down and um, seeing him and helping him celebrate. Awesome. Well, we'll tell Hank we said hi, and uh, we'd we'd love to have him on for even five minutes someday. He sounds like a character. Oh yes, he is. Fantastic. You know what I might do because it is hard for him on the phone because um you know of his you know um you know hearing the piece um as he's gotten older. Maybe what I'll do is um video it, me just interviewing him, mm-hmm. and then we can kind of add that to um our our podcast. Yeah. Definitely. So, yeah, maybe we'll do that. I mean, I have a clip of it from um, a couple of years ago when I had him over the house and he was showing off his picture, um, throwing Muhammad Ali out of the ring and yeah, and telling him the stories, but maybe I'll get a little bit more in depth. I'll talk to him tomorrow night. See, um, maybe, because um, where, where I work at it, my Christmas tree lot is literally no more than a mile and a half from the house. So maybe, maybe one Saturday if I'm working until, say, 5 or 6 o'clock, maybe I'll swing over after I'm done bring one of my friends in a video camera and um, do, a, do a quick um, shoot. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah, happy birthday, Hank. You yeah. heard it here. Um, <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys. Till next week. Cool. Thanks for stopping by. Have a great rest of the week. Gentlemen. Awesome. Great job.